So, um, Mrs. P. A. Lyon or Grace Lyon uh, came back to KRDF for a second round uh, a week later. So we we had part one of her uh, already uh, in our episodes. I think she was back there at episode eighteen. Um, and Grace Lyon is now back with us on episode 22 here at Journeys Through Time. Um, really, really interesting. I think this interview was more interesting than her first one. Um, you know, it's m most, it's all more history on Hansford County. So it's about as detailed of a, of a county history on this part of the world as, as you can get, um, all the little communities that popped up around Hansford counties with with post offices are mentioned you know things these are communities like Mulock and Lucerne and Oslo uh, she talks about of course old Hansford um, she also gets into the first irrigation that happened in the county which was you know not an irrigation well it was essentially the Paladura Creek, somewhere east of Old Hansford, was dammed up and uh, and used to irrigate some of the land down there. So if that doesn't give you an indication of, you know, how things were in those days in terms of uh, Paladura Creek running on a regular basis, because we can't, today we can't, we don't see that. Our, our Powder Creek's dry most of the year. The only time it's not dry is if there's been a lot of rain, and I mean a lot of rain. Um, so there was a time that the aquifer, that the that the water table was so high that all of these springs were running on the Paladuro and enough so that they could irrigate out of it. And then, of course, the dam washed out sometime after they built this dam for irrigation. Of course, we had a huge washout from a flood, and I think some of us have seen those kinds of floods come down the Paldera. Um, she talks a lot about the first days of Spearman, um, you know, what businesses were, were in Spearman in those, in those early days of, of the town. She talks about oil and gas boom of the 20s in 1926 when they started finding oil and gas in the area. Of course, that's North Hutchinson County. Uh, is about as close as a boom got here in the 20s and then on into the 30s and 40s there, there was uh, gas and oil of course discovered in Hansford County. Um, she also uh, outlines the first irrigation well that was drilled here in 1931. So all very interesting stuff. This is what I would re I would call this required listening for uh, anyone that is an avid history buff especially of Hansford County uh, you can't miss this one. Thank you and uh, have a good day and have a happy new year. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Our guest again this morning, as was a week ago, Mrs. P.A. Grace Lyon. And we just didn't have enough time last week to get uh, through with all the information that Grace has compiled through the years for this particular historic tape that we're making. The sponsor today is Baker and Taylor Drilling Company, who wish you a very fine day. And Grace, I think, uh, well, it's just difficult to find where to start and where to begin, but you're going to talk about the early settlers uh, to begin with this morning. The early settlers, uh, of course, were the cattlemen, but then soon after that, I guess soon being 10 or 15 years, uh, there began to be farmers who lived on the plains the earliest uh, cattlemen came and lived along the streams for uh, obvious reasons to get water there and better grass and better feed for their cattle and better protection but uh, we're going to start with the ones who had the courage to get out on the plains and the old wind grace you were talking a while ago about the wind and uh, we made a comment about that i think you and friday were discussing the fact that uh, well she talked about the wind blowing a bunch of apples off the trees last year and i sarcastically or satirically remarked that uh, I never heard of wind blowing apples off trees, but you, you said something about the wind. What was it? Well, I just said I'd lived here all my life and I had experienced strong wind several times 
and uh, of course uh, wind 10 to 15 miles an hour is normal here. Yes. And uh, we both agreed that we would much prefer to be out here and have this wind, even in strong proportions, than to be in the concentrated areas where such horrible things as the Hearst kidnapping take place. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be back and visit with Grace Lyon right after this message from Baker and Taylor. Since Tuesday, March 26th, is that right? Yes. Uh, I can't find it on my calendar. I can't read it then. Yes, it's March 26th. Mm -hmm. And our guest is Grace Lyon. I had hoped that uh, Jesse Davis would be here with us this morning because he's kind of laying off on us. He's supposed to be here Tuesdays and Thursdays. But uh, <laughs> since he isn't here, we'll start out now. You have a research paper there that I think you can use very handily here. Just go ahead and tell us about the early settlers here. Well, the, <coughs> the early settlers coming after 1900, during this period there was a homestead law enacted by the Texas legislature that provided for the sale of public school land. A man could file on four sections provided he improved and lived on one section for a period of three years. At the time of filing he paid $16 per section at a price of a dollar per acre, the balance to be paid over a period of 40 years at 3% interest. Now, he filed on it and, and could pay a uh, dollar an acre for it. Yes. And I thought maybe someone listening to this years from now might wonder what filing on land meant, and that's... That's what it is. And he agreed to improve one section of it. Uh-huh, and live there three years. <coughs> live there. And uh, then pay a dollar an acre, and he could pay that over a period of 40 years. Yes. Uh, he paid the interest each year. He had to send in the interest each year. Uh -huh. And uh, did he have to pay anything on the principal? No, mm -hmm. he just sent, sent in the interest. But any time he could pay it all out and get a title to his land. Get a title to all four sections? Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, did many people do that? Yes, they did. Uh -huh. uh, uh, there's a number of people did. Do you have a list of any of them there? No, I have a list of the people who came earlier. I have uh, a list of the names of the people who came. About what year was this, Fair Grace? From nine, well, they started in 1900, to, in 1900, and most of them were here after 1902 and 3. That's when you came along. <laughs> we came in 1902. Uh, uh -huh. the home, these homesteaders settled on the plains. Uh, they brought their families and farming implements and livestock with them. Many of their first homes were dugouts. For the first time, the economy of the county changed from ranching to ranching and farming. Families settling southeast and south of the county were the Sparkses, Sanders, Wilbanks, Dressens, Edwards, Harbors, Harrisons, and Richardsons, also Lackeys, Medlins, Jarvis, Hart, and Hazelwoods. All of those names very prominent today. Yes, yes they're still here. Their and their children are still here. Yes, Most uh, of the original ones are gone. Uh, and on the north and west plains of the county, uh, where the Spiveys, the Joneses, H.H. <coughs> uh, Joneses, McClellan, Higgins, Woodrings, McBrides, Jameses, Becks, Bernsteins, Tomlinsons, Molliners, Gores, Crosbys. Wilmoth and Venomans. And all of those names still here. Still here, uh-huh. And on the Paladur Creek, east and north of Old Hansford, were the Steeles, Simmons, at Aikens, Andrews, Newcombs, and McMurray's. Uh, not many of them are here. They're, they moved away. Now, I believe uh, Ernie Newcomb is. is one. Uh, he's one of the only ones, I believe, that is still here, uh -huh. really. I, I wanted to ask a question here before we go on. Uh, we used to read a lot of romantic stories that they weren't too romantic at the time, I guess. And I don't know if they actually were actualities or someone's imagination about the, the range war between the cattleman and the farmer and uh, because they started putting fences up at that time. Yes. So were those things in actuality, did they actually happen around? I there? don't think they did in this area. Somebody mm -hmm. that colored things up a little bit. For they must have. I, of course, if they did, the I didn't remember it. <laughs> for uh -huh. the movies. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But you don't recall any of those kinds no, of wars? No, I don't. Was there any kind of uh, 
there was open range up until this time, and was there any kind of bad feeling between the people who fenced it and the ones that wanted the open range? I, I think we, we regretted it, maybe, but I, they knew that it would happen, I think. Had they just accepted it. Mm -hmm. I know my people, we, uh, we leased land close to home and then turned the cattle loose, and a lot of them, they went to the Horse Creek, you know, for water and just Four roamed all over. Away. Yes, uh -huh, <coughs> they did. And that's the way other people did, uh -huh. too. Did they have brands in those days? Yes. That's the only way you could really prove this well, is that, my cattle. Yes, that was the only way. Do you remember what your uh, folks' brand Yes, was? our brand was ESE. My father was a, he was brought up down Corpus Christi near, and he was familiar with the Mexicans, and he named a lot of, he selected Mexican names for a lot of things. What does ESE mean? Well, it's usually the, isn't it? That's the I word I they, sure don't yes, know. Yes, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. So that was a, a different brand. Right? Yes, it was, uh-huh. Easy to distinguish. Yes. All right, uh, I, uh, let's go on with your research paper. Here. Well, I, the next thing I have on my paper is the first churches. Oh, that uh, I don't think we've covered that uh, at length. I at don't all remember uh, on any of these programs. Uh, now, the first in 1900, the Reverend W. B. McCowan was appointed to Coldwater Mission, <coughs> which included all the counties north of the Canadian. In 1901, the first church, the first Methodist church, was organized under a cottonwood tree on the Powers Ranch. Now, where is that tree? Now, the pair is down the creek on the Paladura. On the it's Paladura. near where Clay Gibner's ranch, ranch is. Has, it's just yeah. about a mile and a half west of there, up the creek. Well, now, was this same uh, reverend who was in charge of all these counties up here the present there? Well, no. the. Of uh, the Powers's were Mr. Powers was a Methodist, and the, and the, that was the reason I think they organized it there. And do you know who the minister was at that time? Well, McCowan was uh, the one that organized the the uh, church, but we didn't have a minister at that uh -huh. time. Well, now what was his title? What was he? He was a well, I should think he would you would call him a missionary, wouldn't you? He was appointed to Coldwater Mission. And uh, that that included everything north of the Canadian? North of Canadian, so he had quite an area. Did he have a buggy or did he? Know? Yes, he had a buggy. And uh -huh. uh, how did he dress? Did he? Uh, do well, I, I don't remember him myself. Uh -huh. You see, this was 1900. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but I've heard about him, but I didn't, I didn't know him. Do you know where he came from? Well, um, from the lower area of the state, I'm sure. Dallas and Fort Worth, down in that area somewhere. I don't, I'm not sure where he came from, but I'm sure that's where he was sent out to this area. Now this, um, the mission continued until 1904, this place that he organized. Then the church was moved to Hansford. And uh, there was a Sunday school established there in the courthouse and, and I attended this Sunday school. And uh, do you remember any of the teachers there? Yes, I do. Mrs. Bailey was one of them, uh, Har Bailey's wife, and Mrs. Bailey was uh, Fred Brandt's sister. Did they have Sunday school literature at that time? Yes, we had the little cards. Uh, I rem that's the only thing I remember was Bible the little cards. On. Yes. Uh -huh. And those, I think, the children really enjoyed getting. And yes, they, they did. Home with them. Yes, they did. And they always had uh, a great lesson in. Yes, they did. Add a picture and a lesson on it. And then it go, uh, going on to 1905. The trustees of the Hansford Charge acquired a five-acre tract of land about 15 miles northeast of the town of Hansford, that's down the creek, for a church and cemetery. J. H. Wright donated the material for the building, which was known as Huff's Chapel. And this was the first church building in the county. Now, was uh, was that his nickname, Huff? Huff, Huff yes. Yeah, most people referred to him as Huff Wright. So Huff. it was Huff's Chapel. Uh, yes, uh-huh. And uh, what was the material? Well, it was lumber he had hauled from oh, some place. Uh, yes, uh-huh. How big was the building? Well, it was, um, oh, I imagine maybe it was 14 by 20 or something like that. Probably 15 or 20 people would gather. Yes. Uh -huh. Which was a big 
Uh, yes, and the uh, Wright children and the, and the um, Cowells and what other group of folks, Mulocks, went to, went to this, this uh, church. That was the people who attended these ch this church. Uh -huh. Not long ago, I, I made a history, I copied a history of the Methodist church, and it, we put it in the paper. And one of the Wright boys that used to go to church there noted it, and he told a few things about this first church. Well, now, who, do you know who the preacher was at that time? Well, uh, the preachers were people who came through, you know, and just traveling through here. And uh, I don't, I don't remember. I remember one preacher's name. His name was Ham. Okay. But I, I, I don't. That's the only one I can remember. And uh, they wouldn't be here on a regular basis? No, they'd just be for one Sunday occasionally, you and know. And sometimes I guess the word would come ahead of them and you'd have a big crowd. Yes, everybody would be there. Uh -huh. uh, what'd you do for, did you have a piano at that time in the church? They had a little organ. What kind of organ? Just one of these upright organs, one like you'd have in the home. Uh -huh. <laughs> like the one out here in the main studio? Yes, uh-huh, yes, uh-huh. And uh, did you have trouble finding someone to play them? No, there's always someone could play the, play a little bit. Good singing. Uh, yes. That's uh, interesting. Yes, that's right. And uh, probably the roughest old cowhand, or uh, maybe maybe it's usually though I guess a lady that played. Yes, Miss Miss Bailey I mentioned a while ago was our. She Sunday always school. played for us. She was a Sunday school teacher and she played the organ and she led the singing. She did so many things. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. All right, now, now I, I keep stopping you to ask questions. You go right ahead. Well, now then, I, I leave the churches and go to the uh, schools, the first schools. Now, uh, I want to get one thing uh, in. Did the, did the churches come before the schools, or were they simultaneous? So they were the same time. But it's interesting to note that way back in the beginning of this country, the church was the... Especially after the 1900s. Before that time, I don't think they had. Well, I church. was thinking of even in 1776, the church was mm -hmm. in the in the nation itself. Oh yes, was uh -huh. the important institution. Uh -huh. And uh, I, well, I won't get into that, but I I am fearful sometimes of what's happening in the metropolitan area. Yes, uh -huh. uh, we'll go on. That's what's made the country great. I think is that they have stayed close to God. I think so too. The first schools were established in various communities. The first school was at Farwell, the first town, and Clayton McRae was the teacher, and he had two pupils. And you know who they were? Yes, it was Aaron Kamat and Sadie Guest. <laughs> Out of those names, those people didn't stay. Uh -huh. They're not. They didn't stay very long. We don't have the same. And this school was established in 1880. So 1880. That's, that's that right was that. pretty early, wasn't it? It really was. Uh -huh. Education in Old Hansford began with a private school by M.B. Wright before 1890. And in about 1891, school was held in the courthouse with Tommy McQuillan and Miss Schaefer. In 1902, some of the first teachers was R.M. Richardson, now he was my father, and a man the name of Parrot. Later, Miss Carrie Wells and Miss Gertrude Lyon. Now, Mrs. Miss Gertrude Lyon was my husband's sister. Uh -huh. She came here in those early days and, and she taught. Was one of the teachers. Yes, she taught at Old Hansford, and, but she first came to the North Plains, taught out there first, now, and then later. That, what was the name of that school? North Plains. Uh, McBride School. <coughs> McBride School. Mm -hmm. Now you in talked Grand to Plains too. She taught out there. Uh, you talked to this private school. Do you know what the charge? Uh, no, I haven't any idea what the charge was. Uh, now you graduated into what was pro probably called a public school, but yes. uh, how was it supported? By the county. Did you have taxes then? Uh, yes. School taxes. Yes, we had. It was. We didn't have a nine-month school. Sometimes it was three months, and sometimes eight months, and six months. But they taught as long as they had money to pay the teacher. That's the way <laughs> it went. Huh? Yes. Now, Grace, uh, you attended some of those schools, didn't you? Yes, I taught. I attended the one in Old Hansford. And uh, tell us about the the classroom. Did well, you have one classroom. Yes, one classroom, and and we in had the uh, first grade up to the grown 
17 and 18 years old. There were people, uh, boys and girls, who came. That's rather difficult. And they came in from all over the county, you know, and stayed at Old Hansford and attended school. And uh, did they board with someone? Or? Yes. Some of them had uh, places to stay. They stayed together. I remember some had a dugout that they stayed in. <laughs> and I recall, uh, back close to that time, uh, two or three children of our family would set up uh, what they called lighthouse keeping. Yes. Did you ever do any lighthouse keeping? No, I never <laughs> did because I always lived, you know, near the school. Uh, explain what lighthouse keeping is. Well, that you would say they would come in and stay during the school days and then go home on the weekend. Right. And lighthouse keeping, I guess, it, we was, might it call was it like. Now. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, it was, but they cooked just like they did at home, you know. But uh, not nearly as many things in the, in that particular boat as you'd have at home. Oh, no. Uh, they brought in a lot of food from home, time. I'm sure. <laughs> Maybe their mothers sent, Enough prepared for, the for them. Uh -huh. Now then, uh, in 1896, better known as Ignorant Ridge, uh, Alma Conover was teacher, and it, it was located on the Paladura between the Cayman... Guy McKay and Dave Jones Ranches. And the children, now see, this was in 1896, the children who attended these schools were, this school was James Cater's children, the Tylers, the McCrays, the Dave Joneses, the Joe Joneses, Guy McKay's, and the Secords. Now, Gwynford was one of them that, uh, Gwynford Lackey attended that attended school. Attended that school. Oh, yes. Now, let's uh, talk about that nickname of the school, and evidently it is. I don't know. Uh, they I think just every called community it had an ignorant ridge at one Yes, I, I one think so. <laughs> <laughs> they just <coughs> called it that. I don't know why, but that it was just kind of a... It was a kind of a slang way of referring to kids that went to school, I guess. Yeah, I think so. Uh, it certainly didn't imply that they were all ignorant. No. Because they were learning more than normal. Yes, they were. Now, it was here the well-known Carrie Wells Cotter taught her first school. And she taught schools all over the country. She taught out in the Lieb community in Hudson County, out at McBride, and this school, and then she taught at Hansford, too. She and was one of my first teachers. One of your first teachers. Yes. Uh -huh. And the influence of a teacher is astounding, isn't is it? It, it certainly is. Uh -huh. And then an, another school was located north in the northeast part of the county in 1896, near the J.I. Steele Ranch. Uh, Ella McGillicuddy was the first teacher, and the children of the M.B. Wrights and the W.E. Caldwells attended. And uh, that was near this church that was established, is where this school uh, was. Huff's Chapel. Uh -huh, it was near the church, but it was not held in, in the church building. He was in a little dugout, uh -huh. built on the side of the banks of the Paladura. And then the Grand Plains School was started in 1902, and Miss Wells taught there. And um, the families of the Meeks and the W. L. Richardsons, they were not related to us. They were another Richardson family. Underwoods, McClellans, Howards, and Wilmots. The Wilmots and the McClellan name is familiar. And the Meeks, too. Uh, well, this was a different, different Meek. Meek the uh, this was a different one. Uh -huh. And the McCoo School, I think that's been mentioned before yes. on this program. It was located south of Hansford, established in 1903. And the children of the Wilbankses, the Douglases, the Frizzells, the Wyndhams, the Sanders, Hazelwood, Lackeys, and the Hearts attended this school. And most of those are still around. Yes, they are. And then in 1906, a dugout was dug by the C.C. C. Beck. And, um, and the Beck children and the Nelson B. Crosby children and the Easterwoods, which was in Farwell Draw. Now, this, their first teacher was Grace Wright Hale. Now, that's Wright Hale's mother. Uh -huh. And she was, uh, she was uh, Mel Wright's daughter. Uh -huh. The children of the Crosbys and the Randalls and the Becks attended some, some time. Later, the Kimball Schoolhouse was built, and the dugout school was transferred to this Kimball School. Close by? Yes, it was north of there, and uh, two or three miles. And that building is still out there at the Kimball, but they don't use it. Now, Ernie Newcomb made a point about these schools when he was here, that uh, 
the schools were settled and sometimes had to be moved to yeah. wherever the population was. Yes, that's true. Uh -huh. You tried to... And this was the case uh -huh. in here. The people settled around in the Kimball community and they needed a larger building, you see. So they built They just built a larger schoolhouse and moved the school. Now, the other schools were the Sunnyside School, and that was in the extreme southwest part of the county. Lakeside, located eight miles northwest of Groover, and Oslo was established in 1909. Um, that is, they don't have a school there now, but it hasn't been discontinued very long. Is that right? Uh huh. They, this was included in the. Uh, district of Groover and there they go to school in Groover yes. now but it's uh, quite a ways from us yes it is uh -huh. 18 yes. miles from yes the it is church there. Uh -huh. happy jack at doyle that was uh in 1909 was the oslo school and then happy jack and doyle 1916 and that was on the coldwater creek and that and and woodrow was established in 1917 there were also another dugout school west of Hansford on the Paladura, established in 1906. Now let's go back to Woodrow. Could that have been a name from the president yes, at that time? Yes, that's true. You see, that was 1917 when that was established. And Woodrow Wilson was the president. president. Uh -huh. And then... Uh, well, they just named it for his first name. <laughs> yes, that's, they called it Woodrow. Now, the, I don't exactly remember just who the children were that went to that school but they lived on the cold water and on the area around that's getting up uh, towards gammon yes uh -huh. and um, there were also other um, schools now uh, the woodrow school and then there was a dugout school on the paladura and that's where the less caters children and the R.C. Lowe children attended. And the Medlin School was located near Jess Edwards' place. Uh, Joe Edwards lives out yes, there right. now. That was his father's place. In the southwest part of the county, and Miss Lula Douglas Womble was the teacher. Of course, you <coughs> remember Ms. Womble. She was here and had yes. a kindergarten school, uh -huh. you know. Yes. Now, the schools of Hansford County are a part of the background and have played an important role in the history of the county. They must have. They, yes, surely they have. have. And uh, so many, many prominent names that are still with us today yes. helped establish those schools and, and the children attended. attended. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now, we had a number of first post offices, and that covers quite a few. Quite a few. The first one was, of course, at Zulu. Where was Zulu? Uh, now that is about <laughs> six or eight miles, I guess, from Groover, and it's south west of Groover, and it's on the Paladura Creek, and that's where the. It's getting down close uh, to Morris. Uh huh. But yeah, it is near Morris, I believe. Indeed, it was Groover. It's right off that highway that leads from Groover to Morris. Uh huh. And it's where the old um, stagecoach inn was. Are there located. any, any uh, signs of the settlement? Yes, yes, uh, there's a home there. Uh, it's near the Cater Place, about a mile and a half. And we have a marker out there marking this. You, you belong to the uh, Hampton Historical Historic Society. Mm, yes. And uh, we'll talk about all those markers. Don't let us forget it, because we want to uh, establish where they are. Where they are, uh -huh. But uh, let's go on with the post offices right now. Well, the, as I said, Zulu was the first one. And then Do later... You know what year that was? 1880. 1880. Mm-hmm. And wonder how often they got mail. Well, uh, I really, I think it, it must have come by the stagecoach, or the, that trail. That's where it came from. I'm sure it was brought on uh, from a uh, place in Kansas and to Tascosa. once a week. Maybe. Perhaps once a week. But I, I don't know how often. I didn't have any way of fi finding out how, where the mail came from and when. So I just had to say when it was established. <laughs> yes, I uh -huh. Now, the uh, Hansford Post Office 
was first in 1887, and James McGee, the first postmaster. And J.H. Wright and M.B. Wright, James Hood, Atra Ward, that was M.B.'s wife, Ada Ward, Atra Wright, Ada Ward, Pulaski Mays, you've heard of him, yeah. I'm sure, and uh, Har Bailey. It remained a post office until it was moved to Spearman in 1920. And that was 1887? When it was established, uh -huh. uh huh. So that's... Now, that mail came on that same route that Zulus did, I'm sure, because it came up the creek from Dodge City. Was that called... Tascosa Trail. Tascosa Trail. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, po it was moved to Spearman in 1920. And there were other post office, one at Appleton, where was Appleton? <laughs> now that was down the creek, down the creek. And uh, Addie L. Bays was the first postmistress. It was east of Hansford. And in 1890, it was discontinued and moved to Waverly, and that was still east of Hansford, which was also on the Paladura Creek, north, northeast of Hansford. Waverly was established in 1888 with Ballard P. Ward, acting as postmaster until discontinued November 1890 and moved to Hansford. So mm. Hansford began to be the central focal yes, point. Yes, it was. Mulock established in 1899, located on the Paladour, northeast of Hansford, and Ira Mulock was the first postmaster, and it was discontinued in 1918 and moved to Hansford. They, uh, I guess people out there kept trying to establish a mail service, but there just uh, were not enough people there to keep it. Yes, that's right. <coughs> and they had a, they had a star route, coming from Mulock to Hansford, and then from, from Hansford on to Zulu. Uh, star routes were in existence many, many years ago. Then, well, years uh, ago. well, the first one that I don't know anything <coughs> about was the one that my father carried, and that was established in 1906. And you rode the buggy on that one. Yes, I did. Uh, I think we mentioned that before. Yes, uh -huh. Now then, uh, Lucerne ha was a, a post office in Lucerne in 1909. And John Barnes was the first, first postmaster, and it was discontinued in 1914 and moved to Zulu. Then uh, the Spearman post office was established in 1917, but it, it didn't materialize until... 19 and 20. Wasn't anybody here to No, get well, because the of the war, you see. The uh -huh. railroad didn't come in. The record post office was established in 1925 in Laura Spivey, postmistress. This office was discontinued and moved to Goober. The now, record post office. Uh -huh. That was west, west of Goober, uh -huh. up in the Spivey neighbor yes. neighborhood. Morris post office was established in 29. Now, that was after the Rock Island came through in Morris and Hitchland and Goober, where towns were established. Now then, uh, Etta Powers was the first postmistress. Hitchland postmistress, um, uh, post office was established in 1930. Myrtle R. McComas was the first one. And this, I didn't have the record when it was discontinued. Early routes, now I'll talk about the oh, routes. Yeah. They were called star routes. The mail was not made up by the carrier but by the postmaster and placed in each family's individual mail sack. R.M. Richardson was one of the star route carriers in 1906 from Hansford to Zulu, three times a week. Jimmy Kelly carried the Mulock to Hansford route, and a man by the name of Sargent carried the mail from old Hansford to Ockletree. for Degarman, but I do not have the name of the first carrier. Uh, and that is all I have on the mail route. That's tremendous, I think. Uh -huh. That's just tremendous. Uh -huh. And we'll be back and talk about uh, some other notes that you have there. They're not notes, they're tremendous research papers. Right after this message from Baker and Taylor. Our guest this morning is Grace Lyon, and there are so many, many things that uh, she has done research on that uh, we're going to hurry along and uh, 
try to get a lot of them in this program. One thing, she wants to talk about the first county fair. Uh, you have pictures of it here, or, or at least Dottie West book. I think we ought to, uh, Dottie Jones book, mm -hmm. we ought to pay a lot of tribute to Dottie because this represents a tremendous amount of research and a lot of cooperation from a lot of people to bring mm -hmm. pictures and so forth. Mm -hmm. The book is out of publication, and I'm very regretful for it because I'd love to have had one. And I think it was published what year? Uh, trying to find it, 1965. Mm -hmm. And we came here in 63, and I just wasn't acquainted enough with everything to realize the value of this until it was already gone. Uh, in fact, I didn't know about it until I think everyone had bought it up. Mm -hmm. And Dottie, you ought to get some more books published. Here, I know? don't know where she is now. Uh, but anyhow, let's talk about the first county fair. All right. It was held in Hansford on the courthouse square. The prize for the most graceful rider was won by Gwynford Jones Lackey. Um, now, you had, uh, you must we have had, had a parade. some horsemanship. In uh, oh, we had so many pretty horses here Wonderful. at that time. Uh, the, there was a parade and many beautiful horses, horses winning, winners in various divisions. There was Kershaw's. B.C. Holt, and uh, Kershaw's, that's some kind of a pumpkin, you know. Yes, I'm just telling about what, those who won a prize uh -huh, on this play. B.C. Holt got a dollar for the first prize on his Kershaw's, and Irish Potatoes, J.C. Hancock. And, um, and we grew Irish Potatoes here. Yes, uh-huh. And, uh, and uh, one dollar for fall wheat, J.M. Blodgett. That's Ralph Blodgett's father. I uh, know it's his grandfather. Grandfather. Yes. Well. And uh, and two dollars for white white corn. That was J. W. Jones, and um, that's Gwynford's father. Yes. Uh, and um, Milo Mays, uh, Joe Close, two dollars. Now I'm looking at the picture. There's there's Mays on display, and it's quite different to what we do grow today. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh -huh. Big heads, but they were they had the crooked neck. Yes, they did. Uh huh. And um, watermelon, E. R. Wilbanks. He got a dollar for his prize watermelon. The animals division brought these results: best Jack, J. N. Kirk, ten dollars; sweepstakes sow, O. W. Jarvis. That's Woodville's father. And um, five dollars, uh, art uh, art department, for the best darn sock, Lena Brandt, Bailey, fifty cents. Mrs. Um, Mrs. P.M. Mays won a dollar and a half for her angel food cake. And Mrs. L.S. McClellan, that's Mr. McClellan's mother, mother, had the best cake entry for a dollar and a half. And the best preserves, Mrs. M.B. Wright, a dollar and a half. <laughs> oh, that, that's great. But uh, this was uh, quite an affair. Uh, the Archer brothers, Dan and Otis Archer, had a, a merry-go-round. And it was homemade. They had built it, and it was pulled by a mule. We well, had the carnival atmosphere. There. Yes, and we children enjoyed riding on this merry-go-round. Was there a charge for it? Yes, we paid so much. <laughs> <laughs> but we certainly well, enjoyed it. That's just great to have uh -huh. that information. Yes. And now then... Do you know what year that county fair was? 1907. 1907. Mm -hmm. Now, it says, uh, now then if I may go into do-it-yourself railroad. All right. In 1908, Ockletree, Hansford, Moore, Hutchinson counties had no railroad links. Many people had to travel 50 miles for their supplies. That is, either had to go to Stratford or Guyman, uh, Texoma, or Stratford, or Glacier. Now, in the western part of the county, they went to Glacier. Uh, on the eastern part, Glacier. Yes, uh -huh. And Channing... And Guyman. Every ra everyone realized the need of a railroad. And a 20 year old farm boy, Lynch Dodson, was the first to initiate, initiate an active step to secure one. Through the state railroad commissioner, he contacted A.E. Wiest of Indianapolis, Indiana, Indiana, a railroad promoter. Despite some objections, people in the area decided to try to raise money to build the railroad themselves. Uh, 
Most paid 5% of their commitments and executed notes for the balance. The railroad was to be called the Enid, Ockletree, and Western, and was to reach from Dalhart, Dumas, Morton, across the northwest part of Hudson County to Jarvis, Hansford, Beaver, Wawaka, to Ockletree, a distance of 113 miles. There were plain plans to later extend the railroad as far east as Enid and west to Clayton, New Mexico. Less than a year later, the company was organized and the actual survey made, marking the, the exact location of the road. Actual construction was to be done by the Panhandle Construction Company of New York, and a giant celebration was held on September the th 23rd, 1909, at Dalhart to launch actual construction. Almost immediately, questions began to arise as to the management of the company. As the company was paying four times as much per mile as had been paid by other railroad companies, firms were formed, were found, who would sell engines and equipment at one half the price Mr. Weiss had quoted. During all this time, A. E. Weiss had almost complete control of all the plans and procedures. Now he's the twenty-year-old boy. No, he's the he's a promoter, oh, railroad oh, promoter. Promoter mm -hmm. came out of Kansas City, I guess. No, I don't. He was from Illinois. Yeah, uh, Minneapolis. That's Minneapolis. Right. Uh, yeah. Indianapolis. Indianapolis, Indiana. Yes. Where the speedway is now. Yes. Towns along the route were enlarged with Hansford platting parts of two sections on top of the hill east where the railroad was to pass. It wasn't coming down the canyon. It was going to be. Oh, Hansford no. was going to move on top of the hill. Lot sales boomed. 13 and and seven-tenths miles of steel was laid, and 44 miles of grading was completed. When the company could not meet the monthly payments to the construction company, many people were still paying on their, on their notes. Also about this time, the Santa Fe started buying right away for the, from Darazette West. In 1910, the EO, the EO&W went into receivership and all work stopped. Accusations flew thick and fast, with the lawsuits following, but no clear-cut judgment as to who was at fault. The failure of the EONW went into receivership. Uh, the failure of the EONW spelled the death knell for Hansford, for the Santa Fe Railroad came through and what is now known as Spearman. And how long was it before the railroad came? Well, uh, let's see. The work stopped. I don't believe I have it. In 1910, I believe. It went into receivership. And so it was until 19 and 19, 19 and 19, you see, before the railroad really Actually, got the war stopped the railroad. Oh, yes. Yes, it did. Mm -hmm. That's most interesting. Yes. And uh, I guess... Uh, well, of course, you can remember a lot of that. Oh, yes, I did. I went to the celebrations and so forth. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, we had a lot of uh, oh. real-spirited uh, pioneers in those days. Yes, we did. Uh -huh. And a lot of them lost their money, but that's all right. We didn't get the railroad, but we thought we were going to get it uh -huh. And for they while. had the right idea. Yes, they did. Anyway, I think it spurred the Santa Fe to think about it this area through here. Well, they were raising wheat and they were having to haul it so far, you see. It was really necessary that we have a railroad. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think maybe that was the real backbone of getting the railroad that we got. Yes, So it maybe was. their efforts were not in vain. I think not. I think not. Now, I, I have quite a lot of material on the first towns of the, of the county. I think that'd be most interesting. It will take time. We have Well, we'll we have take time. Months. All right. Well, the early towns, Old Lucerne, was located uh, eight or nine miles southwest of Groover. Guy McKay had sold his ranch to T.A. Cook of Indiana, who brought people to the county on excursions and established a town at Lucerne. It had a two-story hotel, a general store, a post office, and a schoolhouse. Uh, the majority of these people stayed on after the town died. Among these people were the families of the Laytons, the Barneses, 
Mr. Barnes was an uncle of Mr. Fred Hoskins, who was our county clerk for a number of years. Crawfords and the Griswolds and the Wilcoxes. Mr. Barnes was the first postmaster and proprietor of the hotel. He was the foster father of Fred J. Hoskins, who's, who for many years was our county and district clerk. Mrs. D.B. Kine came with her mother and grandparents, the Laytons. Miss Rose Cook was the first school teacher, and the post office was discontinued in 1914 and moved to Zulu. A number of years later, the hotel was moved to the town of Groover. Um, Osceola was a settlement founded by A.L. Mort Land Company of Guyman, Oklahoma, in 1909. Although the town was platted and lots sold, it never was a town. The families who made up the community were all of Norwegian heritage and were in search of wealth and happiness in a new land. They came mostly from Wisconsin and Dakotas, Minnesota and Iowa. The settlement was built strongly around the Lutheran Church, which was one of the first in the county. Oslo is still a thriving community. However, the church is not located on the town site. How far away from the town site? About two miles. About two miles. Uh -huh. And it's a magnificent church, church now. Mm -hmm. Now then, that's all about the new towns, or the towns that were established. And the first, I'll go into the first newspapers. All righty, good. <laughs> the first newspaper was published at Farwell, and the name of the publisher was R.M. Kelly. And in, the, in the 1887, there was a paper established at Hansford, but it did not last long. In 1908, A.E. Townsend and S.B. Hale published the Hansford Investigator. The paper was printed at Garman. Later, the Hansford Headlight was published by Harry Purcell and in 1911 sold to J.H. Buchanan. In 1907, sold to Oren Kelly. When the paper moved to Spearman, the name was changed to the Spearman Reporter, and it is now owned by W.J. Miller. Yeah. Now, how about the, uh, do you remember when they first had the typesetters and the press itself? That they actually well, that was when uh, uh, Kelly? Kelly took over. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And I guess the the news office then was a place that a lot of people congregated. So well, like it was on the main street of Old Hansford, uh -huh. and it was one of the buildings that was moved up here. Uh, and that's all I have to say about the first news. pa newspapers. But now uh, I have quite an article in here about the first irrigation. Oh, that should be. <laughs> Definitely we should have that. Well, in July 1911, a company known as Alamo Irrigation Ditch Company, owned by Tom, Ch Tom and Charles F. Crowley, used water out of the Paladura. Now, this was down the creek. This was down close to where we're hoping to build a dam now. Yes, very near. Uh -huh. uh, it was east of Old Hansford, and I gave the, I gave the number of the section and so forth. It was known as the Huffright Place. They built a dam across the Paladura on this section and laid out a series of ditches and, irrigate, and irrigated alfalfa a number of years until the dam was washed out in 1930. 1930? It uh -huh. that long. Uh -huh. This place is now owned by Emil Knudsen. Uh, uh, the winter of 1911 and 12 was very severe and many people lost cattle, communications were cut off, and school were closed. the schools were closed. There was snow on the ground from November 1911 until 1912 in April, with one continuous snowstorm after the other, causing hardships to most people of the county. So we've had snows before. Yes, at, at intervals, a number of years between, perhaps. From 1903 to 1911 and 12, that's the first bad one bad winter we had. Now the second irrigation project during this time, Coy Holt, who lived on the Les Cater Place, irrigated alfalfa from the Paladura Creek about six miles up the creek from Old Hansford. The first irrigation well was drilled in 1931 by the Panhandle Power and Light Company and located at Old Hansford on the northwest quarter of Section 136. It was operated by, uh, by a man by the name of Todd. 
Bill Hutton now owns this farm, and he still uses the water from this well. Still uses it? Mm -hmm. Does he use it for irrigation? Now? Yes, he does. Uh -huh. That's interesting. That mm -hmm. was way back there in 1930, did you say? Yes, uh-huh, 1931. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Now... Now I go into the coming of the automobile. Good. From 1914 to the present time, the automobile has made many changes in the lives of people in Hansford County. The Model T Ford was the main vehicle of travel in 1914, although there were very few graded roads, mostly just wagon trails through the county. And uh, then I go into the mechani mechanized, machinized, I guess I call it, farming. Prior to 1915, all farming was done with horses, binders, and headers. Wheat was thrashed with a thrashing machine. The grain was stacked in stacks and pitched by hand into the thrasher. And the first tractor, W.P. Edwards, father of Jess and Joe Edwards, was the first farmer to own a tractor. It was a Reeves gas gasoline-operated machine and pulled three plows with nine-inch discs each. That was something. Wasn't yes, it was. Everybody went to see it. <laughs> and the first combine was also owned by Mr. Edwards. And uh, it was a Holt combine and operated from a bull wheel. The year after he bought it, he harvested a thousand acres of oats. A thousand acres? Mm -hmm. That was something. Wasn't yes, it was. Uh -huh. Now then, World War came on in 1917 and 18. Our boys went to the service and did as did boys from every other county of the state. War bonds were sold and there were Red Cross drives. Only one boy from our county uh, lost, his life. lost his life, and this was Su Sullivan R. Spidey. And uh, I think his name is at the courthouse. Yes, yes, it is. And, uh -huh. and Jess Hayes, that's Floyd Hayes' brother, he lost a hand in the war. He, those are the only two casualties of the county. And there was quite a number went. Oh, My husband went. He went from here at that time. And Max Lackey. Did PA go overseas? No. He got in the quartermaster corps and they kept him in El Supply. He was in San Antonio all the time. Mm -hmm. In 1919, the Santa Fe was built into the county and a terminal at Spearman. Spearman was planted in 1917 and lo lots were sold, but the war delayed the building until 1919. Spear I think we've had this before. I think about it's him. most unusual, though, that a town just picked up and moved. Yes. Uh, what is it? How many? Six miles? Yes, six, six miles. Just picked up and moved. Well, Uncle Tree did the same thing. But, but that's still unusual. <laughs> yes, it is. They had to go to the railroad, of course. <laughs> the first building moved to Hansford from to Spearman was the John R. Collard Real Estate Office, and it was located on the lot now occupied by the TGNY. That corner there. Yes. Albert Liskey of Canadian built the first elevator in Spearman, as well as in Hansford County. In 1921, the town was incorporated and city officials were named. Mayor Hugh James, city clerk and alderman R.L. McClellan, and other aldermen were L.M. Womble, M.C. Head, Tom Kerr, and Fred Brandt. The first buildings on Main Street were the, the first brick building on Main Street was the Hale Drug Store. At one time, Spearman had six lumber yards. Six lumber yards? When he first started. Uh, can you we imagine have that? One now. Yes. Of course, it's seven or eight times as large. Yes. Uh huh. There was there was a, a lumber yard on every corner. <laughs> <laughs> and and in conjunction, I suppose they had hardware too. Yes. Well, I I don't know whether they did or not. We had a hardware store in Spearman. Uh, B. V. Andrews had a hardware store. The first schoolhouse was moved from Hansford to Spearman and was located on Block 62 and 63. The first edition. This is one. This was on the block where the Olin Sheets home is. Do you know where? No, I'm. I'm That's not. on Bernie Street. On Bernie. Uh huh. Not it's, too far. It's it's near the Baptist Church. It's on the same street. Right there. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit south. Uh -huh. uh, the first organization was the Chamber of Commerce, 
and the first city project was a water well for the town with Leo Dacus in charge. The first bond election was for a light plant with operations beginning in 1924. That's the first electric lights we had was 1924. 1924. What did you have up until that time? Kerosene lamps? Yeah, we had those. And gasoline lamps? Yes, lamp. gasoline lights. Uh -huh. Another project was an ice plant. That was pretty important, too. Yes, it was, and uh, because there was no refrigeration at that time. No. The first boom was in 1926, when oil was discovered north of the Canadian River. In Hudson County, that was in Hudson County, Spearman was shipping, was the shipping point of the oil supplies. For the first oil and gas wells drilled north of the Canadian River, this discovery well was north of the river near Sinet in Hudson County. The first paved street, Main Street, was built a brick in 1927 and 28. The Amarillo Liberal Line of the Rock Island was built across the northwest part of the county, and the towns of Hitchland, Groover, and Morse were established. In 1930, the Santa Fe extended from Spearman to Morse, so it connected up with the, ro uh, with the Rock Island there. In 1930, the Dust Bowls day started and tried men's souls. <laughs> Yes, they did, and mm -hmm. I think we covered that one. We covered that last time. Anything else that you think of, Grace? Well, uh, the first paved highway, All well, right. I think that in 1930, the, uh, in, uh, in 1933, although right-of-ways were purchased in 31, the highway designated number, 19, uh, number 17, and now number, I don't know what it is, what is it, 102? Well, I don't know which highway it is. Coming from Borger. That's uh, 207 now. 207. Well, I, was, I meant to look that up, and I didn't do it. <laughs> it connected Spearman with Periton and Borger and, and changed the travel habits of the people. It really did. Yes, it did. And until there was a bridge across the Canadian from Pampa to Periton, this was the only way all the people could get to Amarillo through this bridge. Yes. And uh, certainly The not. bridge was over the Canadian, you yes. see. On December 1914, 1934, the Spearman Library, sponsored by the 20th Century Club. Of it, which you are a member. Yes, I, I'm a charter member. It was located in the city hall, and the first librarian was Anna Lee Morton Kirk. It became a co county library in 1950, and is now co-sponsored co by the Lions Club, the 20th Century Club, the city of Spearman, and Hansford County. Hansford County. Mm -hmm. And uh, has done a magnificent job. Yes course now then I went into the Second World War. Can I go on with sure, this? Sure, sure. We have about five minutes. All here. right. In September of 41, the Second World War was declared and the sons of the First World War were veterans. Uh, the war veterans were called into service and, uh, and there were several who did not return. And during the war years, the first gas wells were drilled in the northern, northern part of the county and drilling continued all during the war. Spearman grew steadily with no particular boom until 1953, when oil and gas production became extensive. The oil and gas industry was brought, brought, has brought many people to Spearman, and for the first time, Spearman had an industrial payroll. I think we covered that for the some. For uh -huh. 53. 53. Now then, in 19... And Forty-seven, the first hospital was established. It was called the Hansford County Hospital. B.J. Garnett donated the first city block, and I believe we covered that, too. Yes, I think so, and moved in the Army barracks from the Yes, uh-huh. And I believe I told who was the first patient and so forth. Yes. Now then, irrigation started. Uh, although it has been mentioned that some irrigation was done from the Paladour Creek, the first irrigation well was drilled in 31, and I mentioned that too before. Hansford County has the fastest growing irrigation in the North Plains. Now, this was written in 1965. That's 10 years ago. And it still is. Uh, uh huh. It has more wells and more acres under irrigation than any other county north of the river, Canadian River. We now have over 660 wells and over 135,000 acres under 
irrigation. And I think that's uh, almost double now. Yes, I, yes. In the past 15 years, towns in Hensford County have built beautiful churches, new school buildings, beautiful homes, thus providing for the health, the spiritual, and education values of its city, citizens. At the present time, Hensford County has 250 miles of paved roads, many of these farm to market roads built during 1950s. Also, we have 90 miles of Caliche roads. Hensford County is now composed of three school districts. For, from roaming Buffalo country with stage coaches and, and making trails, sparse population, and beautiful prairies, Hensford County has developed into a modern county. The prairies have turned into farmlands with hundreds of irrigation wells. Modern highways and wire fences mark each mile of the county. Oil and gas have added a good share to the prosperity of the county. Our forefathers came to settle and to struggle to build the Hansford County Empire of today. Thank you so much. Our guest this morning is Grace Lyman. We're having to hurry because we're almost out of tape as well as time. And Grace, thank you so much for this wonderful addition to our uh, memorial that we're establishing in the library. We appreciate it so much. We'll be back tomorrow with another edition of Spearman Information. Our guest today has been Baker and Taylor Drilling Company, and they join me and Grace Lyon in wishing you a most pleasant day.